The Life and Sad Ending of Earl Scruggs Earl Scruggs was born Earl Eugene Scruggs on January 6, 1924, in the Flint Hill community of Cleveland County, North Carolina, a small community just outside of Boiling Springs, about 10 miles west of Shelby. His father, George Elam Scruggs, was a farmer and a bookkeeper who died of a protracted illness when Earl was four years old. Upon his death, Scruggs' mother, Georgia Lulu Ruby, was left to take care of the farm and five children, of which Earl was the youngest. After his father's death, Scruggs seemed to take solace in playing music, and when not in school or doing farm chores, spent nearly every spare moment he had practicing. His first radio performance was at age 11 on a talent scout show. Scruggs is noted for popularizing a three-finger banjo picking style, now called Scruggs style, that has become a defining characteristic of bluegrass music. Prior to Scruggs, most banjo players used the frailing or claw hammer technique, which consists of holding the fingers bent, like a claw, and moving the entire hand in a downward motion, so that the strings are struck with the back of the middle fingernail. This motion is followed by striking the thumb on a single string. The three-finger style of playing is radically different from failing. The hand remains stationary and only the fingers and thumb move, somewhat similar to a classical guitar technique. Scruggs style also involves using picks on three digits, each plucking individual strings downward with the thumb, then upward with the index finger and middle finger in sequence. When done skillfully and in rapid sequence, the style allows any digit to play a melody, while the other two digits play arpeggios of the melody line. The use of picks gives each note a louder, percussive attack, creating an exciting effect described by the New York Times as like thumbtacks plinking rhythmically on a tin roof. At age 10, when Scruggs first learned the technique, he recalled that he was at home in his room after a quarrel with his brother. He was idly playing a song called Reuben and suddenly realized that he was playing with three fingers, not two. That excited me to no end, he later recalled, and said he had ran through the house reportedly yelling, I've got it. From there, he devoted all his free time to perfecting his timing and to adding syncopation and variations to it. At age 15, Scruggs played in a group called the Morris Brothers for a few months, but quit to work in a factory making sewing thread in the Lily Textile Mill near his home in North Carolina. He worked there about two years, earning 40 cents an hour, until the draft restriction for World War II was lifted in 1945, at which time he returned to music performing with Lost John Miller and his allied Kentuckians on WNOX in Knoxville. About this time, an opening to play with Bill Monroe became available. Bill Monroe, 13 years older than Scruggs, was prominent in the country music at the time. His career started with the Monroe Brothers, a duo with his brother Charlie. Bill sang the higher tenor harmony parts and the sound called High Lonesome, which he became noted. The brothers split up in 1938, and Bill, a native of the bluegrass state of Kentucky, formed a new group called Bill Monroe and the Bluegrass Boys. They first played on the Opry in 1939 and soon became a popular touring band featuring a vocalist named Lester Flatt. The name Bluegrass stuck and eventually became the eponym for the entire genre of country music, and Monroe became known as the father of bluegrass. With Monroe and Lester Flatt, Scruggs performed on the Grand Ole Opry and in September 1946 recorded the classic hit Blue Moon of Kentucky, a song that was designated by the Library of Congress to be added to the National Recording Registry and later added to the Grammy Hall of Fame. The work schedule was heavy in Monroe's band. They were playing a lot of jobs in movie theaters all over the South, writing in a 1941 Chevrolet from town to town doing up to six shows a day and not finishing up until about 11 at night. In 1948, Lester Flatt and Earl Scruggs performed Flatt and Scruggs and the Foggy Mountain Boys. The name came from a song by the Carter family called Foggy Mountain Top, the band used as a theme song at the time. In the spring of 1949, their second Mercury recording session yielded the classic Foggy Mountain Breakdown released on 78 RPM phonograph records that were in use at the time. On September 24, 1962, the duo recorded The Ballad of Jed Clampett for the TV show The Beverly Hillbillies. 
sung by Jerry Scoggins, the theme song became an immediate country music hit and was played at the beginning and end of each episode of the series. The song went on to top one on the Billboard Country chart, a first for any bluegrass recording. The song spent 20 weeks on the chart. It also reached the top 44 on Billboard's pop chart. Over their 20-year association, Flatt & Scruggs recorded over 50 albums and 75 single records, and featured over 20 different musicians as Foggy Mountain Boys, sidemen backing the duo. By the end of the 1960s, Scruggs was getting bored with the repetition of the classic bluegrass fair. By now, his sons were professional musicians, and he was caught up in their enthusiasm for more contemporary music. In early 1969, Scruggs formed the Earl Scruggs Review, consisting of his two sons, Randy and Gary, and later Vassar Clements, Josh Graves, and Scruggs' youngest son, Steve. On November 15, 1969, Scruggs performed live with the newly formed group on an open-air stage in Washington, D.C. at the moratorium to end the war in Vietnam. Scruggs was one of the few bluegrass or country artists to give support to the anti-war movement. The Earl Scruggs Review gained popularity on college campuses, live shows, and festivals, and appeared on the bill with acts like Steppenwolf, The Birds, and James Taylor. They recorded for Columbia Records and made frequent network television appearances through the 1970s. Their album, I Saw the Light with a Little Help from My Friends, featured Linda Romstadt, Arlo Guthrie, Tracy Nelson, and the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band. This collaboration sparked enthusiasm by the latter to make the album Will the Circle Be Unbroken. Earl and Louise Scruggs made phone calls to eminent country stars like Roy Akouf and Mother Mabel Carter to get them to participate in the project to bring a unique combination of older players with younger ones. Bill Monroe refused to participate, saying he had to remain true to the style he pioneered, and this is not bluegrass. The album became a classic and was selected for the Library of Congress's National Recording Registry of Works of Unusual Merit. Scruggs had to retire from the road in 1980 due to back problems, but the Earl Scruggs Review did not part ways until 1982. Despite the group's commercial success, they were never embraced by bluegrass or country music purists. Scruggs remained active musically and released The Storyteller and the Banjo Man with Tom T. Hall in 1982 and a compilation album, Top of the World, in 1983. In 1994, Scruggs teamed up with Randy Scruggs and Doc Watson to contribute the song Keep on the Sunny Side to the AIDS benefit album Red Hot and Country. In 2001, Scruggs broke a 17-year personal album hiatus with the album Earl Scruggs and Friends, featuring Elton John, Sting, Don Henley, Johnny Cash, Dwight Yoakam, Billy Bob Thornton, and Steve Martin. In 1955, Scruggs received the word that his mother, Lula, had suffered a stroke and heart attack in North Carolina. The only flight available from Nashville involved such a series of connecting cities that it was not feasible to fly. Scruggs and his wife, with sons Gary and Randy, decided to drive all night from Nashville to see her when they were involved in an automobile accident just east of Knoxville about 3 a.m. on October 2nd. Their car was hit by a drunk driver, a Fort Campbell soldier who had pulled out from a side road into their path, then fled the scene after the collision. The children were not hurt, but Earl suffered a fractured pelvis and dislocations of both hips, which would plague him for years. Louise had been thrown into the windshield, receiving multiple lacerations. They were flown to a Nashville hospital, where Scruggs remained hospitalized for about two months. He received thousands of letters from well-wishers. He returned to music in January 1956, after about four months of injury. But after working a week or so, one of his hips collapsed after he returned to the hospital for a metal hip to be implanted. Seven years later, the other hip required similar surgery. The first metal hip lasted for some 40 years, but eventually failed, requiring a total hip replacement in October 1996, when he was age 72. While still in recovery from the hip operation, Scruggs suffered a heart attack. He was returned to the operating room later the same day for quintuple coronary bypass surgery. Despite the dire circumstances, he recovered and returned to his musical career. At age 88, Earl Scruggs died from natural causes on the morning of March 28, 2012, in a Nashville hospital. His funeral was held on Sunday, April 1, 2012, at the Ryman Auditorium in Nashville, Tennessee, and was open to the public. 
He was buried at Spring Hill Cemetery in a private service.